Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We want to thank you for joining us at this press conference with the Ministry of Health and Wellness and the Ministry of Education. My name is Kadisha Watkins. I'm the Senior Public Relations Officer in the Ministry of Health and Wellness. We have with us this morning Dr. the Honorable Christopher Tufton. He's joined by senior officials inside the Ministry of Education. And today we will uncover the findings on substance use and emergent issues in secondary schools. At this time, I will now hand over to Dr. The Honorable Christopher Tufton, Minister of Health and Wellness, to give his opening remarks. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I must tell you I prefer the other format, but I'll, I'll take advice and guidance. Thank you very much to all for being here. Let me first of all recognize my colleague minister, Minister Cuthbert Flynn, who uh, is, uh, is essentially one of the key drivers of the, the work, the policy work at the National Council on Drug Abuse based on our shared burdens here in public health. And, and so um, she has been providing some guidance and she'll be doing some more work uh, as we unfold some of this information later on. I want to recognize also um, Dr. Kassan Thorpe, Chief Education Officer, Acting, is it Troop or Thorpe? Troop, all right. Um, Chief Education Officer, Acting, and uh, the Acting Permanent Secretary, uh, Mrs. Maureen uh, Dyer. Uh, I want to also recognize other members of the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health, who are here and those who are listening in, and from the National Council on Drug Abuse, the entire team, but I, I want to recognize at the head table the person that you are going to hear from, uh, perhaps more than any other, and that would be Mrs. Uki. You say it is Swahini and it means honey. She's very sweet, okay? <laughs> she shared it a while ago. I just felt I had to share it with you, okay? Atkinson, research analyst at, at the National Council on Drug Abuse. So today we wanted to discuss with you uh, the issue of substance abuse uh, based on uh, a, a, a study that has been done. Uh, it is the start of a process because it was a uh, a relatively quick turnaround study to do an initial assessment to determine whether or not additional deep diving is necessary. And the conclusion is that we will have to do additional deep dive. Uh, clearly, it's a collaborative effort, which is why the Ministry of Education and Youth is here, uh, as it involves young people. And the National Council on Drug Abuse has, as it's a critical part of its mandate, the uh, monitoring and the um, reporting on and the response to issues around substance abuse. Uh, a lot has happened over the last two years and it has had an impact on our, our young people, uh, you know, and that has led, we believe, to some of the challenges that we will uncover and discuss. So substance use has been a, a trending topic. Uh, a lot of discussions have been taking place and with increasingly new and creative ways to abuse various substances across each cohort. And so from a public health perspective, it is a very important area to track and to develop new and improved ways to monitor and to respond, and in so doing to collaborate. And this is particularly important as it relates to our young people. So reports of pill parties, for example, have surfaced in recent times in the local media, uh, accompanied by a growing concern of increased substance use among secondary age students. Uh, globally, there have been issues also, emerging concerns, noted including psychoactive substances that present a serious challenge to public health and heighten the demand for a response through policy, drug um, policy, policy to minimize, to cauterize, and hopefully to eliminate uh, substance abuse. Uh, we are not, we don't exist in a vacuum. 
we are very well connected, as COVID has shown. Started one place, affects everyone. And the trends around substance abuse, almost uh, automatically, once it starts somewhere, gathers momentum, uh, becomes a part of a sort of subculture, uh, carried through in many ways and forms, and ultimately reaches our shores if, if it didn't start here. And so we have to also monitor the global issues. So these drugs are unfortunately unpredictable, particularly when they are emerging, poorly understood, and are becoming widely accessible. What we are witnessing, as evidenced by the <coughs> study that will be discussed, is a normalizing of drug use, especially among our young people in particular areas. This is symptomatic of a public health threat warranting for us an important response, response to gathering more information and response in terms of policy adjustment. This is symptomatic of a public health threat warranting urgent response, I said. What is more, despite the proven dangers, the challenge of ri rising drug use tells us that other issues are intersecting and ballooning. Psychosocial challenges, which we have spoken about, we have addressed issues around mental health, for example, uh, grief, trauma, and more other, other issues. The health risks are real, and those most vulnerable include, as I said before, young people, many of whom are uh, impressionable and are following a trend hoping to seek to achieve relief in some way, shape, or form, many times not understanding the effects or the side effects. Today for us serves, should serve to highlight substance use among secondary students as a matter for national attention, which is why we're having this dialogue. It's really about engaging the populace. Our coordinated response is also an attempt at intervening before things get worse. So there are signs that the COVID-19 pandemic is connected to increased substance use. That's one thing that we have noted. And we have evidence of that. We have evidence of that in terms of the hospital system, in terms of the toll-free lines and the calls that we receive. Uh, there is that side effect coming out of, of, of COVID. Uh, the local data from NCDA has point to increased use, for example, of alcohol and cannabis as a result of anxiety, depression, loneliness, financial challenges, uh, and other forms of, of concerns around the, the, the restrictions that COVID would have posed or the response to COVID and concerns that are related to those restrictions. Uh, for a closer look at the impact on, the, on our youth, we therefore decided, as we had said, that assessment would be necessary to do a rapid situational assessment. And we conducted that in May 2022, uh, where we went into 13 secondary schools. Assessment involved 160 students from grades 8 to 10 and took place across 13 parishes. Additionally, we spoke to the administrators slash teachers, the guidance counselors. So 20 guidance counselors were also interviewed. So a qualitative uh, data collection and analysis based on the experiences of those persons the experiences that they have observed, and in the case of guidance counselors, clearly the, the, the students that they would have to respond to and deal with in their normal course of work. The assessment sought to disclose, among other things, perceptions around substance abuse being used by adolescents and changes in patterns of use. Uh, while it is recognized that the rapid situational methodology is not um, statistically it doesn't capture an entire population, or some may argue sufficiently the entire population. What it does do, it provides a basis through the qualitative data analysis to capture trends. And when you compare that against data that you have previously, uh, those trends represent important data points that may require more interrogation further assessment, and uh, hopefully um, appropriate responses. And this is what this has, has said for us. So what are the main findings? And I'm going to mention some, and then we will have a, a presentation. Uh, to begin with, the party drug Molly, which 
have been a, a part of the discussion in the media in recent times, uh, emerged as among one of the more popular substances in use by adolescents. Um, so it has emerged as a very big part of substance abuse among our adolescents. What is worrying is that participants in all focus groups reported that Molly has become a widespread substance in Jamaica. That we will, we, we will uh, ventilate that a little more. A greater part of concern is the ease of access and exposure to the drug. Students identified purchasing pills online or accessing it in communities. Others were knowledgeable about its effect, having witnessed their peers with it. What drug experts know about Mali is that it enhances mood producing uh, a stimulant-like effect, drives the propensity for deviant behavior, sexual activity um, being one such for underage uh, young people, and has high abuse potential, um, and abuse in one form or the other. It also damages, from a clinical perspective, brain functions and cognitive development. So it is a serious threat, and therefore the trend in increased use represents a clear and present danger. At the same time, vaping of tobacco products and cannabis and the consumption of edibles are also dominating the drug space with our, uh, our youths. The findings of this assessment reveal a troubling ease of access to e-cigarettes for youngsters with adults as their uh, enablers. It also hints at the dangers of the so-called fun flavors of e-cigarettes, which are often marketed as safe alternatives to smoking, but let me be clear, this is not clinically proven. In fact, it is false. In other words, these synthetic substances with particular flavors, you know, colors and, you know, the cherry flavor or the, this flavor, uh, oftentimes mimics the nicotine effect, uh, but it is made in a lab. And uh, if you look at the data and the coverage, in recent times, coming out of places like the, 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 the US and other countries where a lot of work has been done, we are now getting there, um, you will see where significant concerns have been raised about some of these substances and its impact on individuals. Persons have ended up in the hospital, have lost some of their functions, and I could go on and on. Um, it's concerning. I'm a parent, most of us here are, or will be at some point. It is a concern for us. And I know firsthand, based on the anecdotal evidence that I have received from persons known to me or otherwise, that uh, tobacco consumption through e-cigarettes are very popular in the school system among our young people. Uh, it's easily camouflaged. I mean, it could be a pen-looking object you know, something that you would normally use. And so it's very difficult for the administrators to, to identify at times and to deal with it decisively. And it is being supported oftentimes by persons who should know better, but who of course are seeking to profit from this kind of behavior. The focus group has demonstrated or confirmed what we suspected. E-cigarettes uh, deliver a heavy dose oftentimes of nicotine that reportedly alters connections between brain cells and can cause problems with not only learning, but also mood and impulse control. The use of e-cigarettes is also reported to worsen anxiety and depression while setting youngsters up for lifelong addiction and the smoking of tobacco cigarettes later on. You may recall or, uh, that we are now pursuing comprehensive tobacco legislation a lot of discussion now taking place in the parliament through the Joint Select Committee, which I chair, and soon we will be on the parliament floor debating the bill, hopefully to become legislation. There are all sorts of arguments, some advanced by the tobacco companies as to why they should have the freedom to express themselves, whether through advertising, distribution, or otherwise. Uh, from a public health perspective, there is no justification to smoking. Um, people do it, and it's allowed, it's legal. So let's be clear, but certainly when it comes to underage uh, children or our kids in schools, uh, not only is there no justification, it is 
dangerous. And when you start to experiment with alternatives, it makes it worse. So we are pursuing the Tobacco Control Act 2020 to protect our young people. And we certainly crave the support of the population uh, when that time comes for this to be discussed and debated. Uh, there are grave concerns to address with our youth. Um, I want to appeal uh, at this point to parents and guardians to talk to and to monitor their children. That's my uh, second um, recommendation. The reason why we're having this is not to make anyone scared, but to make us sufficiently concerned and to say to parents and guardians, talk to your children, uh, 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 observe things like mood swings, um, isolation, uh, deviant behavior. I mean, young people will be young people, so there will always be conflicts of one form or another, but how you resolve those issues and also, frankly speaking, sometimes the company that they keep. If you know that someone is involved in that kind of behavior, that may not be the company for your child and, and maybe that's a response too. And where you are uncertain, maybe because you don't have the, cert the, the clarity of the skill sets you think to respond, the schools, and I'll allow the ministry to speak to their system, but the health system at the level of the parish, the health center are available, including uh, toll-free lines, which you will mention earlier. So it's important that we see this as a response by all, not just the public health system or the Ministry of Education. In fact, this rapid assessment has uncovered associated issues from struggle with mental wellness to anxiety to depression and even suicidal ideation. Uh, at this point, I'm going to pause and allow Ms. Atkinson, research analyst at the NCDA, to provide us with a closer look at the rapid assessment. Good morning, everyone. All protocols observed. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share with you the results of NCDA's rapid assessment conducted in May of this year. So I'm not sure if you're sharing. You're sharing? Okay, wonderful. So the NCDA conducts a number of studies, national surveys that look at not only the adolescent population, but also the general population. Through these studies, such as the Global School Health Survey, the Global Youth Tobacco Survey, uh, the National Secondary School Survey, the General Population Surveys, we're able to look at things like the prevalence of substance use among adolescents. So we're able to say that you know, alcohol use is, there's 40% of our, of our adolescents report alcohol use. The average age of onset of drug use is between about 11 to 12 years old. And, you know, we're able to also look at things like access and exposure. With approximately 50% of our adolescents reporting easy access to substances like alcohol and cannabis. Now, these studies, as we said before, are representative at the national level. However, given the COVID-19 conditions and the fact that we were unable to collect data across the island representatively in schools, we have conducted rapid assessments to determine what is happening among our adolescents now. As Minister outlined, these are not prevalence studies and therefore we cannot use this information to say across Jamaica, adolescents have increased substance use by X percent. So we want to make that very clear. It's a qualitative methodology that gives us keener insight into what is happening in some of our parishes. Now, I want to also mention that this rapid assessment is actually a follow-up to a previous one that we did in 2021. In 2021, we conducted focus groups among secondary school students to look at how COVID-19 has impacted them what have they been experiencing and what are they seeing among their peers? This particular rapid assessment looked at, now that they are back in school, what are the realities that are being faced? And particularly because of the, the report that came out of the St. Catherine South Division where pill parties are occurring 
you know, and, and the use of edibles is increasing, we went out to do this. As Minister outlined, it was 13 parishes that we conducted focus group discussions among 160 secondary school students from grades 8 to 10. Now remember, this is not a prevalent study, so we did not ask them about their personal use of substances. We asked about their perspectives on substance use among their peers and what are the, ba the major issues affecting them at this time. And so, the things that came out, and if you would follow my slides, in 2021, what we looked at was how the pandemic has affected Jamaican adolescents. What were the substances that were being used? What were the coping mechanisms that they were engaging in and what kind of support did they need? This time around, we wanted to see how is it now that you are back in school? What are the main issues again? What are the main drugs? And how can we, as an agency and as a ministry, impact? And as ministries, not just um, health, but also education, what are the strategies that are needed? Now, in 2021, these are the issues that arose. So the lack of devices and connectivity, mental health issues, the dynamics at the home, in the home environment, including abuse and discord and distractions, difficulties learning, the social isolation, the lack of opportunities to express themselves. These were things that were outlined by our adolescent participants. This is March 2021. In addition, there was a perceived increase in substance use among not only students, but also in communities. At this time in 2021, the, the use of Molly was not mentioned by any student across the focus group discussions. However, when we went out into 20, in 2022, this is May now of this year, as Minister outlined, a range of issues were raised by both students and guidance counselors, and these included the mental health problem, so significant levels of anxiety and depression, and suicidal ideation. In fact, in, in some of our focus groups, students who were participants expressed that they themselves were, were, were considering suicide. There was a young girl who kept saying, you know, all right, I'm not going to kill myself today. And when we said, you know, you, what are you? And the young people around her said, every day she come here and she talk about she's going to kill herself, you know? And, and the guidance counselors expressed that it is, it is, suicide is something that is being discussed with more ease nowadays compared to, to times before. Verbal, physical aggression, and weapon carrying. This is not something new. This is something that we have been seeing in the news in recent times in school, school communities, in school environs. In fact, while we were doing the data collection, a number of focus groups were interrupted by physical violence and, and issues that were going on in the school while we were collecting data. So this is also an issue that is considered to be urgent among our adolescents. Excessive sexualized behavior and pregnancy was another issue flagged by guidance counselors and students. It was felt that given exposure to inappropriate material, particularly through social media platforms, that this was having an influence on their behavior in the school compound currently. Inattentiveness and hyperactivity and the loss of interest in academics, that was also an issue that was raised. And the fact that you know, coming back into the school environment, it was very difficult for the students to resettle. And therefore, the ch teachers were having significant difficulty getting them to focus. Now, drug use, of course, this is where we are interested and we are, you know, we're focusing on today. Drug use and increased access and exposure, that also came out. And we're going to go into that a little bit more soon. Scamming. Now, the new name for scamming, as if you all don't know, and you must know, is what? Chopping the line. So chopping the line is also something that came out quite significantly. And we're not only talking about, we need to make this very clear, it's not only Western parishes. So in the past, it was felt that, you know, scamming is something that the Western parishes are engaging in. This was across the 14, 13, sorry, the 13 parishes that we went to, both students and guidance counselors spoke about their involvement in scamming and the fact that some of the students have not returned to school because of the money that they're earning from scamming and the fact that they have lost interest in academics. 
So that's another reality. Inappropriate social media exposure. We spoke about that before. Um, there are a number of platforms, not only the traditional TikTok and Instagram and so on, but there are WhatsApp groups and messaging and, 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 and websites and so on that students are sharing inappropriate content and being influenced by such. The lack of parental guidance is something, and participation, not just the guidance, but the participation as well, is something that also came out quite heavily in the focus group discussions. Influence of popular culture. Now, there are some, from the beginning of time, there have been you know, entertainers and so on who sing about things that are less than appropriate. The feeling right now is that this is, this is, this is occurring more than before and that it is having an impact on the behavior of our students. So things like scamming and drug use and badness and all of those things are being influenced by some of our very popular current entertainers. Coping with grief and loss. There are a number of children who have lost more than one family member and the issues of grief have not necessarily been fully addressed. There are a number of students who are facing chaotic home environments, and those things are having an impact on their behavior. So as Dr. Tufton outlined, when we asked about the popular substances that are currently being used, molly, vaping, and edibles are what came out as the top three. Now prior to this, what the council has found in our studies is that alcohol, tobacco, and cannabis were the most pop popular substances. Our context is changing. The context around the world is changing. New psychoactive substances are becoming much more accessible, much more popular, and being influenced, as we said before, by exposure to all kinds of different media. So with Molly, just to give you some quick facts, Minister outlined some, just to say that it is one of the party drugs that have become more popular in recent times. We did not typically have a pill-popping culture, nor do we typically have an injection drug use culture, but things are changing, and therefore it is incumbent on us to stay on top of these things and try to prevent them and create interventions that are necessary at this time. So Molly acts on three main neurotransmitters, serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. These things control things like mood and aggression and sexual activity or sleep, feelings of pain, blood pressure, heart rate, you know, emotions, motivation, all of those things are impacted. And in the short term, it can do things like increase our heart rate, um, increase our blood pressure, cause muscle tension, teeth clenching, nausea, higher body temperature, and most importantly, increase the risk for unsafe sex. Now, these things came out in the focus groups, and you will see a little bit more as I share. As we know, and we know that the media has been waiting on us to come out to speak about this Mali issue because it has been trending in our midst, right? So the dance hall, there are people who have come out to say, you know, People, dealers need to stop issuing molly in the dance hall. It has taken over. Nobody is interested in alcohol anymore. They're mixing it with alcohol. They're mixing it with ganja. It is a part of our context and our reality right now, and that is clear. What we want to do now is just share with you some of the literal quotes that came out of the student focus groups. With molly the students were able to describe what the pills look like. They were able to tell us where they get them, who uses them, how it is used, that it is crushed. Sometimes it's put into alcohol. It's used at parties. They were able to say it's, it, you know, it, has, it has been around. It's not something new, but it is something that is becoming more popular, mainly because of how much more exposed they are to it through the music. That is what came out. Another thing that's important is the range of, of price, prices that were quoted for a pill. So students spoke about pills costing as low as $300 and as high as $2,500. What, um, what does this suggest? Internationally, it is known that Molly has a high potential for 
um, mixing with other drugs. It's called adulterant. So they can add all sorts of different substances that are very harmful to, to human health, including things like bath salts, cocaine. Some of these pills may not even have any MDMA in it at all. Uh, and so it is important for us to be able to determine things like the purity of the pills that are being sold. Is this really M MDMA? Or is this something that is mixed with all sorts of other things that are going to harm not only our young people, but also the young adults and older adults who are using it? All right. So moving along. Moving along. Right. So another thing that came up is the fact that, you know, it, it, it is felt to be a drug that is, is, is useful for sexual activity. And so what some students said is that the women, you know, when they take the molly, they get on freaky and molly is for women and ecstasy is for men. So there is, there, it's clear that students, one, they don't really know what molly is because molly and ecstasy are actually the same thing. Both of them are MDMA. Two, the risk perception is quite low. In other words, they think it's just a feel good, fun drug and the fact that it can have serious impact on their health is not widely known. All right, let me go, go on. I just want to also mention that the report for the rapid assessment, um, it, it details more of the, the student perspectives and the guidance perspectives. So you will see that. All right, I'm trying to get my, um, my slides to move on to the next. The next thing is vaping. And as Minister Tufton outlined, it, this is very popular among our adolescents at this time. Now, in the past, it was felt that vaping devices are things for uptown children. It's uptown people can afford those and use it and so forth. This is not what we have found. This is not, um, it's not subject to socioeconomic background nor location. So we're talking about rural, urban, remote rural youngsters speaking about being able to buy vape devices in, in all sorts of settings, including online, as well as in convenience stores, gas stations, a wide variety of vape shops, and to be able to do this without being encumbered. So there's nobody that's saying to them, are you 18 years old? May I see your ID? they are able to access it quite freely. They're also selling it, by the way. Um, in some schools, it came out that there are students who have it on their WhatsApp status, and you're able to buy vape devices very easily. So we have a major problem. That's the bottom line. We have a major problem in terms of access, exposure, risk perception. All of these things are impacting our young people. And we really want to also make the the point that drug use is not the be all and end all. Sometimes it is just the symptom of deeper things that are going on among our adolescents and there is need for us to dig way deeper than just saying, stop using drugs, it's harmful, don't do it. You know, there's a wide variety of interventions that are needed and I'm going to quickly speak about them. Okay, all right, edibles. Edibles is something also that came out. And the thing that we need to recognize is the fact that edibles are widely, you, you can never know what you're getting. So somebody can cook, bake a cookie or a, or a brownie and put a significant amount of cannabis in it compared to others who may put just a little tips. You know, and therefore the impact on students is wide and varied. A number of them gave personal accounts of their own use of ed edibles and how it impacted them. Um, some spoke of adolescents who ended up in hospital because of the acute reactions that they had to edibles. And what we have found is that the perception of risk is very low. So they feel that eating ganja is way less harmful than smoking it. And therefore, there is a propensity to, towards you know, engaging in edible use. Again, the, the access to it and the exposure was very high. They spoke of being able to buy it anywhere. You just have to have links. You know, we can make it ourselves. Guidance counselors spoke of instances where students are bringing them to school, cookies and so on. Those things are happening as well. Now, 
We said molly vaping and edibles. This does not mean that alcohol is no longer present. The fact is that alcohol is still quite popular. And so rummy bears, the presence of rummy bears in schools, um, they, they talked about braffing. Braffing is being able, rummy, not gummy. So gummy infused, right, infused with alcohol is what is called now rummy bears. And they're selling it, they're carrying it to school. They are also taking these things in school, on school compounds. They spoke of braffing. Braffing is, you know, being able to go out and you, you floss it. Well, flossing is what we used to call it before, just show off, you know. <laughs> but now there are all these different names where you can go and you buy top shelf liquor. And, and you're able to show that you have the money to be able to buy things like Hennessy and all of those other drinks. Now, the influence of the music. We really want to take a little bit of time here to say that while popular music may sound good and, you know, it has its place, what we would like to highlight is that it is significantly impacting our young people. Um, they referenced a number of DJs, which maybe we, we wouldn't speak about that right here now. But, but those things came out in, in the focus groups, the heavy influence of Mali use and, and access to cannabis and drinking and smoking and badness and so on. All of that came out. Very quickly, I want to just outline the interventions that the NCDA offers, the multiple levels of interventions that we currently undertake. NCDA has been in existence almost 40 years now, and we conduct what is called demand reduction initiatives. These include universal prevention. So as Minister spoke about things like policy and so on to be able to protect youth from substance use, sale to minors and so on, that's, univer that's environmental prevention where you talk about policies and legislation and so on. Universal prevention is where we target an entire group with a message, with, 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 with public education, with health messaging to be able to promote healthy behaviors. Selective prevention is where we target children who are at risk by virtue of academic failure, where they live, their home environments. Then we have indicated prevention, we have family prevention. Family prevention is not just about telling parents how to talk to children about, their, about drugs. It's not about that only. It's also about building bonding, parental bonding, parental participation. How do you set rules? How do you monitor your child and know where they are, who they're with, when they're coming home, those kinds of things. We build bond, fa family skills and bonding, parenting skills. Community prevention is also what we do. We partner with a number of stakeholders to be able to develop bottom-up strategies for prevention. Now, the NCDA is also part of the response program for special programs like the Child Diversion Program, as well as the Citizen Security Program, where we offer counseling services and treatment services to those who need it. Yes. And, and I wanted to also mention that what you're seeing here as the demand reduction initi initiatives is one side of the coin. Demand reduction in this whole drug control um, uh, thrust, demand reduction works hand in hand with supply reduction. Supply reduction is where you talk about law enforcement, interdiction, you know, seizures and so on. W the way for us to be successful in our initiatives is for those things to be working in tandem. And though the Ministry of National Security is not present here today, uh, we have been working with them to be able to do things like, you know, um, conduct some kind of chemical analysis on these pills through forensics to be able to determine what is in these pills that we are calling Molly. Is it really Molly? Is it really MDMA? What else is being mixed with it? And what kind of systems can be put in place for greater surveillance and so on? So I just wanted to mention that while there's demand reduction, supply reduction is equally important. Thank you very much for your attention. I want to just uh, recognize the NCDA, National Council on Drug Abuse, because I think this information is very important, and, and they have done a really good job at 
you know, living true to their mandate and, and doing the work that is necessary in collaboration, of course, with other critical stakeholders like the Ministry of Education in this case to get this data. And as I said before, this data is intended in the first instance to provide information and then hopefully through information, appropriate responses at all levels of the society. You know, I, maybe I shouldn't go there, but I, 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 I feel compelled to. In, in recent weeks, I've heard a lot of criticism being levied against the Ministry of Education, the Minister of Education, and I, I sometimes share the view, maybe just to myself, that we really, as a country, need to consider in a more deliberate and in-depth way the mammoth task that we face uh, in this instance, specifically speaking, to our children and the challenges, the new and emerging challenges, some of which we have just outlined here, and the response, the root response, the, the primary response that is required to even attempt to understand and then to respond to these issues. It's, it, it's not a Minister of Education issue or even a Ministry of Education issue alone. This is not to say it's somebody else's problem. This is to say it is all our problem. And I really want to just encourage us as a society that even while we offer constructive criticism, uh, we should also reflect on what each of us roles are in trying to address challenges that none of us anticipated and that changes almost daily. And this issue of substance abuse is clearly not new. There are traditional substances there. But some of these things are just coming on the, on the, on the, in the, in the space in the last year. You know, COVID is not anything that we have experienced. The side effects are new in, in many respects in terms of how you manage to, to recalibrate and to respond. And so, as I said, you know, my colleague minister is, can speak for herself. This is not a, a, a brief about the minister, but I, I sometimes empathize and probably even sympathize. Um, Ministry of Health has its own issues, of course, and I, I, I benefit from a lot of those criticisms sometimes, but I really think we need as a society to look at some of these issues. And this is why I think a conversation like this is necessary. So I was particularly taken uh, by the presentation around the demand side, the demand reduction of, of um, the response. Because again, there is a debate that needs to be had in our society around how we solve these issues. Every time we speak about demand side con response, um, you get into conflict oftentimes with advocates around freedom of choice, freedom of expression, freedom of this, freedom of that, the democracy that we live in, and so on. And uh, we have had to face that a lot. When you talk about front of package labeling, trans fats, whether or not a man is entitled to sell cigarettes or vaping material across the road from a school. He's actually on his own property, but he's across the road from an uh, institution. Then you start to dissect the nuances of the response, and you run the risk sometimes, even at the highest level of the land, the courts have been challenged because we are you know, depriving persons of their options that they should be expected to exercise. And the same could be said for the popular culture. That is a raging debate. Um, I'm not here to pronounce uh, as an opinion on the impact of popular culture and so on. I'm here to reflect in the study based on the responses what people are saying and persons who are involved in the process. And I really do believe that many of us, including myself, need to start listening more uh, even before we volunteer an opinion sometimes that is already framed by some traditional variables because there are other variables now that we have to consider. So what is our response? Um, we have outlined the general uh, role of the NCDA. We recognize, firstly, the need for further research. So the first, uh, uh, um, the first position that is to be taken beyond here is that the rapid response, rapid assessment, 
does not measure pre prevalence. However, it provides us with the preliminary data, and it's a starting point. And already, the National Drug Prevalence Survey, which is to be provide, which is to provide key insights into substance use among the general population, from 12 to 65 year, years old. Uh, it came out of a need for evidence-based research to guide the alcohol policy, which is now in formation. We're hoping to have a green paper soon. Alcohol abuse policy. Alcohol abuse policy, um, just to be politically correct. And that is going to inform, uh, hopefully, conversation and then decision around policy in terms of how we regulate while allowing clearly for persons who are suitable age-wise and otherwise to consume their alcohol. Um, that is important. And so we're going to add to that uh, many other variables, including what has just transpired. We are, that the, the proposal is before the Ethics Committee, no, I'm Ethics Committee. So we are well advanced in the consideration. The instrument has been drawn up. Some of this information will, be, will inform some of the further questions that will be asked. It's expected to cost some $16 million. And um, the last study similar to this was done in 2016, so we are due. So the first, first announcement, if you will, is that we're going to be going in a, a much more comprehensive way on these issues at a cost of $16 million, which is a national drug prevalence survey. Secondly, the current data will be gathered, will also be gathered through the school, global school health survey, uh, global school health policies and practices survey on the patterns of substance use among a subset of the secondary school population. So that study is done how often? The global school. When was the last? Huh? The last one was 2017. The last one was 2017. So that will now focus on that cohort. And that will give us a much more accurate read on these issues. And, and that is going to be in train. Plans are also in train for the updating of the school drug policy. Uh, again, these emerging trends will inform a, a review of that policy. And the National Council on Drug Abuse will coordinate this in conjunction with the Ministry of Education. So that's a decision that has been taken and will proceed. Also important for us to improve access to help and the capacity of the public health system to respond. The NCDA's helpline is a, is a resource that can be used. It's 564-HELP. Um, 564-HELP, five, four four that's 564-4357. We also have UMATA, the mental health line, it's 768384897. But the truth is, uh, you can go to your parish health office, and there's one close to almost every community, at the town center or in your community. Speak to a primary health care nurse. If they can't manage it, they'll refer it. There are mental health officers at, across the country. We must use our health systems more um, for these things because prevention has to be a big part of addressing some of the concerns. And if persons are unclear, uncertain, they can do that. Plus, of course, the Ministry of Education. So we will seek to bolster that, and I'll speak to that shortly. Additionally, our mental health program, which we announced in our sectorial and have commenced, which is a recognition that mental health is a side effect of COVID. We have collaborated with the Psychiatric Association, Psychology, Psychology Association, huh? Society, Society, and the Ministry of Health. And we have created a sort of uniformed approach to going into schools and into communities that has started to provide psychosocial support, of course, working again with those individuals and entities within those institutions and communities who already have training for that. So we, are, we have beefed up that response as part of the response. Over the next six months, we will roll out also a, a public education campaign using a multi-channel approach with a number of interventions at the school and community level. This involves town hall meetings, especially as we move to sensitize parents and what to look out for if they, have sus if they suspect that their children may be using drugs. Part of the larger conversation that we want to engage the public in involves uh, equipping parents to foster better relationships with their children and allow a safe space for sharing those concerns. Um, you know, what, what is happening is that we all have to engage in the role of parenting 
and good parenting, whether they are our children or not. Um, it's a classic case of the village growing up the child or being our brother's keeper. Um, and part of that is to foster relationships sufficient to establish comfort and confidentiality where necessary. And we're going to be trying to work with our respective stakeholders to try and achieve that. Of course, these interventions require the support of our partners and stakeholders across ministries and organizations. Uh, and today is an, an important example of that with the Ministry of Education here. And as said earlier, the Ministry of National Security is a part. So I'm going to invite at this time Dr. Thorpe Troop, Troop, Chief Education Officer, to offer a perspective on the and, and uh, as it relates to the Ministry of Education's response. Dr. Troop. Oh, P.S. Okay, sorry. I, I Madam Moderator, what a terrible situation. We would have wanted to be discussing more pleasant things this morning, but indeed this is a part of our reality. So to our ministers present, um, Dr. Christopher Tufton, Minister of State, um, Juliet Cuthbert and our Executive Director of the NCDA, our presenter of this study, um, Mrs. Yuki, did I get it? Uki, okay. And um, Dr. Troop, members of the executive of the ministry here present and the media, good morning. I'm particularly pleased that this collaboration, even though the subject matter is not what we would have preferred to, to discuss, but indeed we must face the reality of um, the space that we're in at this time, we've always collaborated with the council. I know that on the ground, when our children, young people, run afoul of the way they ought to operate and the way they use substances, they always come to you and you always give us advice. So you're good partners all along. I want to thank you for the presenting the findings of this study, the rapid assessment qualitative study it may not be a big study, but it is indicative, and we take it seriously. So it will inform some of the strategies that we already have on the ground, because we are aware that there are problems with substance use and substance abuse in the school system. And so we're going to take this seriously and take the findings to help us to continue and to ramp up. Um, some of the existing strategies that we have in this space. So we understand that these substances are mind-altering, behavior-altering, and mood-altering. And just by virtue of that, schools are about teaching and learning, right? So this is going to be impacting the process. We can never expect to optimally benefit from what we are doing in our classrooms if we have children who are impaired. And so that is why we take it so seriously. We know it impacts teaching and learning, but also the relational processes in the schools. You would have seen upsurges in um, bad behaviors among some of our students. And although we have no empirical data at the moment, we have no doubt that some of these behaviors would have been influenced by the use of certain substances. So um, we are also concerned about the ease of access. I believe that came out in the study. And um, you know, sometimes, although schools are controlled environment, we have no control sometimes over the surrounding, the shop across the road, or the um, vendor two doors down, and so on and so on. So we are concerned about that. And as we move to create policies to make our schools safer places, I have no doubt some of those factors will come into play. I'm also concerned about um, the role of adults in this thing, because it came out in your study. 
you know, how do you access, who provides what and where and so on. No doubt we're going to have to be looking to see um, what are the penalties in place, how do we influence people to not influence our children in these directions. So that's going to be a part of what we do. But um, the ministry's intervention at the moment will have to be ramped up based on the findings here. We have our guidance and counseling unit and um, our head of guidance and counseling is with us this morning. Safety and security, Mr. Troop, you're here. Um, our school leadership teams, which include our guidance counselors on the ground, our deans of disciplines, our peer counselors, PTAs, students, um, counselors, and all members of the community. We, this is a Jamaica problem. It's not simply a school problem or a child problem. If we want to raise our young people to be all that they can be, everyone needs to come on board. Our spend as a ministry at the moment budgeted for, we have $20 million that we had set aside outside of personnel. We had set aside a $20 million for behavior modification and counseling coming out of COVID. We understood that many of our children had gone through severe um, challenges in terms of depression and all sorts of other things. Um, there was another $15 million, and Mr. Troop, you'll have an opportunity to talk about that where it as it relates to safety and security and the provision of cameras so that we're able to spot areas, blind spots in our schools where um, sometimes illicit activities can take place. So my appeal today is in light of this and in light of all that we know that our adults, our parents, should stop paying lip service to the raising of our children in this nation and come on board with us to help us to make sure that our children at least get a chance to be all that they can be. Thank you, and if you have any further questions, members of the team are here to um, take them. Thank you, Minister. All right, so we want to thank our presenters here with us today. And um, certainly this is a matter of national importance as Minister Tufton had indicated. We're going to now take questions from the media. I'm sure you have a number of things that you want to present to our ministers uh, uh, and the National Council on Drug Abuse and the representatives from the Ministry of Education and Youth. So we're going to start with those who are here in the room. Uh, we had positioned a microphone to allow you to project your question. And so we're gonna ask you to use the microphone that is to my right if you are able to as best as possible and we'll take your questions. Is that possible? No? Oh, we will we'll take the mic to them. All right, could I have someone just assist me with that? Or you can, if you're comfortable, you can go ahead. So we'll start with Ms. Peter Gay Hodges from the Jamaica Information Service. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, morning, everybody. Um, I just wanted to an opportunity to hear from Mr. Troop about how that fifteen million dollars um, will be spent on safety and security. If you have details, that would be good. Thank you. Yes, we'll invite Mr. Richard Troop, director of the Safe Schools Program in the Ministry of Education, to respond to Ms. Hodges' question. And at the same time, if there are others who may have a question for Mr. Troop, we'll ask you to just give it to him while he's at the lectern. Thank you. Good morning. So the, the question on the $15 million spend um, for speak specifically to our commitment to support six of our target high schools with 
um, the procurement and installation of CCTV surveillance system. You know, sometimes given the, the structure of our schools and the difference is to find some blind spots, the use of CCTV and system is very important. And this is a commitment that a number of schools that have already invested in, and it's a commitment of the Ministry of Education to target those particular schools with particular challenges to be in a position to utilize technology in their efforts to treat with um, surveillance and monitoring. Can, you name the six schools? Can I name the six schools? Okay. So, um, my memory serves me right. <laughs> Denham Town High and Papin High in the parishes of Kingston and St. Andrew, Heltham High in St. Catherine, or Rockabessa High in um, St. Mary, and Grange Hill and, uh, Grange Hill and, uh, well, can't remember the, the other, Grange Hill in Westman, and Hopewell High, also in St. James. Thank you very much. Hopewell High is in Anova. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, my question to Mrs. Atkinson, uh, could you say where, I know you said access and exposure is a big issue. Um, are these students getting them from family members? Are they being sold in the communities? Could you talk to me about that, please? Are they getting Mali? Mali. Yes. So, right, so the question is where are the students getting them from? We didn't specifically ask that question because very often in focus group discussions, when you get into details like that, students become very closed. Um, however, they offered information about being able to access it. In fact, some of them said it's all over Miss. You can get it in the community. You know a link. You have a friend. You have an adult friend. There are some whose uncles sell it. I mean, they, they spoke about very wide and broad access. So. What we want to be able to determine is, are we making molly here in Jamaica? We're not sure. We're not sure. This is, that's police work, right? And so this is something, as we said, in terms of partnership with the Ministry of National Security, we can hone in on those things some more. But we don't know the exact um, access points, just that it's broad and varied. Yes. Okay, could you give an idea of some of the, the modalities for the upcoming surveys, um, how you'll go about um, getting the information to, to make it a much more wide-ranging um, survey? Okay, so the National Drug Prevalence Survey, that is the general population survey that will be conducted among 12 to 65-year-olds in all parishes. Now, that is uh, the, 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 the methodology for that, and I should mention, we partner with the Organization of American States, the Inter-American Drug Abuse Control Commission, that has a protocol for these surveys that are conducted not only in Jamaica, but other Caribbean islands and other Latin American countries as well. What it enables us to do is use very highly scientific um, methods to select a sample that is representative both at the parish level and at the national level. So we do interviews um, across the country. It's household-based. Um, participants are randomly selected. And when you do it in that manner, you're able to say that your study is representative of the population. So we will be able to say after that that St. Anne and St. Thomas and St. Catherine, we'd be able to look at prevalence within parish as well as overall nationally. This question for the Education Ministry. Uh, based on the findings uh, in, in, uh, today, would we need additional resources to deal with uh, the, the substance abuse? Okay. Thank you very much for that question. Good morning, everyone. Um, Additional resources, it's always, that's always a challenge for us. But the first thing that we have to do is to target our resources. So as Pierce indicated, we have 
what we call helping professionals in our schools. We have in excess of a thousand guidance counselors in our schools right now. We have over 139 deans of discipline in our schools. And these persons are part of the helping professional team. We have senior managers. We have our National Student Council. They are very active leaders in our school that help um, with the, this kind of issues with our children. And we have our peer counselors in our school. We have a layer of teachers that we put in our schools recently, with, who we call our health and family life educators. So we actually introduced a health and family life curriculum in our schools. And within that curriculum, we have an entire module on drug use and abuse. We have an entire module that is look, looking at decision making. How do we teach children to make decisions? Um, we looked, we, we, we have children looking at, you know, looking at their cognitive abilities, how to think through things, you know, um, decision making, problem solving kind of skills. So that curriculum is strictly skill based and that is very important to the response. To, to what our children will be exposed to, you know, what they are exposed to, because at the end of the day, we talk about the supply and demand, we have to build the capacity of our students to make good choices, because the circumstances are what they are. They are going to be here. We have people in our society who make decisions about their own incomes, about their own survival, not understanding the risk that they expose our children to. And so our children must make that decision, m must make, take that proper decision or appropriate decision in respect to their own development. Our role, though, as the ministry is to ensure that the enablers are in place, our guidance counselors, our health and family life educators, our student leaders, we build their leadership. You know, PS spoke earlier about our budgetary support, which is additional to the services we have in our schools already. And, of course, we have a training budget in our ministry that we use to make sure that our guidance counselors are refreshed, retooled, to treat with this. This is new, this is new you know, um, it may have been in the space before, but the prevalence of it is of concern to us. So Pia spoke earlier about us going back to make sure that there's training, there's research. So our deans will have to do some work, Mr. Troop. Um, Kenneth is here, our guidance counselors will have to be retooled. A part of this presentation will definitely be um, a part of a wide scale sensitization with our guidance counselors and our helping professionals in the field. So yes, we have to retarget the resources and where we need additional resources. In light of what we have just heard, we may have to um, reallocate to make sure that our students are safe. Can I add to that? that we, are, we will be training up the guidance counselors and the persons, the school personnel, in screening brief intervention and referral to treatment. So that will be done at the local level as well. We have a question online when you're ready. Thank you. Uh, so we have an indication of a question from Zoom. I'm not sure if this is the hand that's raised. We'll allow for that question, and then we will take another and wrap our press briefing. Okay, so I've, I've been asked to read the question. It is from Omari Jackson. Um, and he says, with regard to cannabis edibles, the criminalization of these products has led to the inappropriate sale of products. With proper regulations and education, edibles can be distributed in a controlled environment. Um, why don't we empower our youth instead of disenfranchising them? Um, I'm not, he hasn't indicated where he's from. Oh, I'm sorry, Sovereign City Entertainment and Ganja Activists. All right, I think some perspectives were offered in terms of capacity building. Uh, Minister, I'm not sure if you wanted to add more, but uh, Dr. Troop just mentioned some perspectives in terms of equipping our young people. Is there a final question? Dr. Tufton. That line of argument is not, uh, doesn't become a mainstream argument. I know it's, a, it's used oftentimes by advocates for, um, you know, cannabis consumption and tobacco consumption and so on. The same thing I said earlier. Let's bear in mind the primary context here. We're here with the Ministry of Education. We deal with underage um, young people. Uh, young people who are in a process of learning and development. We're not dealing, you know, to bring into that conversation a generalized discussion about all of us is, is, not, is not appropriate at this time. We're saying coming on the heels of this examination, that these are children in school 
underage who are using and abusing substances. And so I really don't want to confuse the issue. I think that is impatient of debate, that that is a very dangerous thing. And the fact that it is a trend that is increasing, uh, the person who asked the question who did not identify themselves, I, I am sure, as a responsible individual, would appreciate why this would be concerning. All right, um, I'm going to have to go now. Is there any other burning question? Sorry to, <laughs> to have to go to Sentana. Huh? Anybody else? No? All right, Madam Chair, I'll leave you to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tufton. So again, we just want to express our thanks for joining us today, our online viewers, uh, members of the media, our senior officials from the Ministry of Education, uh, our ministers, Dr. Christopher Tufton, Minister of State, the Honorable Juliet Cuthbert Flynn, Permanent Secretary Dwyer and Dr. Kassan Troop and her team. We thank you so much for the partnership. And again, we express thanks to the media and those who are tuning in. Thank you.